Thank you very much, and thank you for indulging um, laptop. It worked, and then it didn't, and then it worked. Who knows? Um, so I'm just going to um, very quickly jump into... Louder. Louder. Can we have the... I don't have a very loud voice, I'm sorry. So this may need with some speaking. Hello, hello. More? Test, test. I'll just carry on, and we'll see. Yeah, great. Um, so welcome, um, and I'll just, yeah, great. Um, so we're going to talk about what Redis is, uh, the impact of the Commons Clause, uh, and what are the next steps as a community, what we actually do, and things like that. Um, uh, some very quick stuff about me, like some sort of, um, what would you call it, hat management, I believe, uh, do it. I mean, one hat I've worn in my life is um, this one, which you may recognize. Um, uh, that's, yeah, um, but in terms of like sensible hats, um, answering that question sensibly, I'm on the board of directors of the Open Source Initiative. Um, I've uh, been a Debian developer, official Debian developer for 10, 11 years now. Um, I'm a current Debian, Debian project leader. Um, I'm also on the Debian, um, I do quite a bit of things in Debian, but one thing in particular that's relevant to today is I'm part of the FTP team. And this team uh, it, it literally manages the files in the Debian archive, you know, making sure they get put on uh, places where the mirrors can slurp them in. Um, they um, remove old, un outdated packages um, or undesired packages. So, oh, we can't have this package anymore, let's get rid of it. Or ones that are just like crufty and old, like GTK1, you know, it's gone, okay, we re um, remove it. And that's responsible for this team. They also do the approval of new packages. Um, not only to um, ensure the namespace of the packages is sane, but also from a legal point of view. So every single um, sort of brand new package that comes in, it gets analysed for is it like is this free software and things like that. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, they also reject um, packages that don't meet quality guidelines. So if they do idiotic stuff, um, then they're just rejected on those kind of grounds as well. Yeah. Um, inclu um, including legal grounds. So if a package comes in and it can't be distributed because for whatever reason, um, then it gets rejected at, at that point by the FTP team. So I've sort of got a bit of a handle in sort of a few, what do you call it, Fing lots of fingers in lots of different pies. Um, but I'm not really wearing any hats. I'm just sort of, you know, yeah, that's just not speaking for anyone on behalf of anyone, things like that. And I... Um, I'm a, sort of, I'm a sort of freelancer person, so I don't have an official employee anyway, so I don't have to sort of do the usual spiel around that. So what's the background here? Um, what, what is Redis? Like, what, what actually is it? It's pronounced Redis, by the way, not Redis. Took me like five years to realize that. Um, <laughs> so it's an in-memory database that persists to disk. If you've ever used memcache, it's like pretty much the same protocol. If you see what I mean, like you, you can sort of interact with it over Telnet. It's like that one at those kind of things. Um, but um, in contrast to, say, memcache, it persists to disk. Um, so whilst it's sort of in-memory database, yeah, it's sort of a NoSQL. It came around, we know, when that kind of um, thing was becoming a bit more cool or um, people were kind of pushing against relational databases in some ways. Um, it started in 2009. Uh, that's when the first commit is, and it was actually quite a busy project from day one. Uh, very heavily used in web development, again, because of, um, yeah, in the same way that sort of MongoDB is like, oh, we can just sort of um, scale horizontally because we've got an in-memory database. I'm not going to go into that. That's a different question, um, things like that. And it's released under the BSD from, I don't think the license ever changed. Yeah, BSD from day one, yes, definitely. Um, what's Redis Search? So Redis Search is a search engine module that sits on top of Redis. At, what, at um, some point in the last two, three years, uh, Redis um, got a module system. So you could write sort of external modules. So this is so you could sort of link it with some something else that would never go in the in the, the Redis core code. Um, sometimes just for like why why sort of bloat the upstream repository with all these features? You can just have them as modules and they work just as well. Why not? Things like that. Um, that's kind of cool. Uh, released under the HTPL um, from the beginning um, by, um, by Redis Labs. 
who are a um, company, I think, founded in 2010 or thereabouts. Um, the author of aforementioned Redis Search, um, and launched, they launched a cloud-based version of um, um, Redis on AWS in 2013, um, things like that. Um, great. So, I mean, the timeline here is that the, um, I first uploaded uh, Redis to Debian in 2009. Um, everything's great, lots of users, um, good feedback. Um, it's pretty cool, used a lot. Um, I know this because if I break it, I get a lot of, a lot of reports. Uh, yeah, so I think it has quite a few users, so yeah, it's kind of cool. And um, that went on for many years, absolutely no problems at all. Um, and then I saw it had a module system and some external modules, so I thought, why not package the modules? People are asking for them. Cool. Um, so I uploaded Redis Search to me in 2017. So as that date, the previous date implies, 2009, no, nope, just great, no problem at all. Um, I it was sending some contributions to, um, as part of the packaging of Redis Search, I sent some contributions, you know, like fixing some things here, like, oh, it doesn't just compile properly here, or, oh, this bit's a bit, you know, we're using a newer GCC, so I just sent some things to fix some warnings and things like that um, back upstream. Nothing, nothing that crazy, right? no, no reworks, it, almost quite tiny patches. And in May of last year, I got an email saying, well, actually, thank you for your contributions that you've made. Um, hope you find the project useful and can use it. Okay. Yeah, cool. Um, next sentence was, due to a license that the project uses, AGPL, we require that you sign a CLA agreement. Please reply with a signed version of your earliest convenience. So, okay. Um, can you elaborate why using the AGPL requires a CLA? Like, I didn't, I didn't get it. Like, I didn't really understand the mail. Um, so I just sent it back quite quickly. So the AGPL has no relevance to CLA, while AGPL is a distribution license. The CLA is only about contributions to the project. The CLA basically grants Redis Labs a license with special permission to use the contributions as we see fit. As we see fit. With the CLA, you could just potentially make proprietary forks. It seems somewhat at odds. It, seems still at odds if you have a CLA to have an AGPL project. Like, I don't, I don't quite see the, uh, like, I, yeah. You want to have a diversified group of copyright holders for an AGPL project or GPL projects in general. Okay. This is where my ball fail. I can honestly say I have no intention of doing anything like that. We'll have to last the lawyers. Okay, well, okay, cool. And um, when we published uh, published our AGPL Redis modules. We were less organized and quite new to doing open source. As time passed, following other companies in the space, Mongo, we decided to adapt the CLA practice. Okay. Okay, well, yeah. That said, you actually... <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, they're doing sort of goodish stuff in that area. Uh, you know, no problem at all. I met some of them, kind of cool. And... The stuff I'd done was like super trivial. It was like, you know, adding, I think one of them was adding, um, you know how in C you have fall through statements on a switch and one of them was unlabeled. You know, it was those and I would fix one of those. So it was just like, is that even copyrightable? It doesn't matter. But yeah, yeah. And then this happens. Uh, the um, Redis Labs modules, all of them were licensed, relicensed from AGPL to what's called um, the Apache license with the Commons clause um, in August. So um, just to clarify, Redis is not like the same as Redis modules. It's that there's a module system that's part of Redis, but like a particular module that's a, a particular Redis module is not the same as Redis and they don't, um, yeah. So Redis, as, a, as it says here, uh, Redis itself will always remain BSD, um, but we decided to prevent cloud providers from creating managed services from certain modules including Redis search. Okay. So what is the commons clause? So one thing is like it's not a license in itself. There's not a commons clause license from a sort of technical point of view. So it's sort of a, an amendment to a license. It applies a narrow mineral form commercial restriction on top of an existing one. And so you would apply that on top of, well, it sort of makes sense to apply on top of the Apache license. You know, if you were going to uh, combine the two, that sort of makes sense. Um, in practice, the Commons Clause only adds a limitation concerning fair use. 
Uh, both licensing approaches share the same core value, making the software available for use by everyone. Well, yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. I mean, so what? So what's the problem here? Like, like. Uh, mm, yeah, we can. Yeah. I mean, let's take a, a brief diversion into the Debian Free Software Guidelines. That can kind of frame it quite well. Um, so the Free Software Guidelines were written in Ian. When were they written? Don't ask me that question. 20 years ago, 20 years ago? Yeah, something like that. I should know this, sorry. Um, they, yeah, they, say they basically determine what constitutes free software, uh, from a, sorry, from a Debian point of view. And this means what, um, whether they go into, this is the test whether they go into Debian or not. So um, I'm not going to go through them all, uh, but number one is free redistribution. So obviously free software, you should better redistribute it. Makes sense. You should be able to make derived works. Makes sense. It's kind of obvious. Um, there's some very interesting ones like uh, license must be not specific to Debian. So uh, this is all around this sort of um, you could grant. It's like oh, um, there's this problem with your software, um, but Debian you can use it for this. It's like no, no, no. It can't be specific just for Debian. It must be like sort of transitive, and it should apply to everyone else as well, which is kind of cool. Um, this was the um, the, the Firefox Ice Weasel um, issue. Because, yeah, ask me later. Um, the most important one today is um, DFSG6, no discrimination against fields of endeavor. So um, often you'll get things like, um, oh, use this for anything you want, free software, it's all cool, but not, um, not if you're like, you know, in sort of nuclear facilities and not, you can't use it in nuclear bombs or things like that. Yeah. Or genetic research, so you're kind of getting a bit more like, um, I'm not sure anyone is really like, pro setting off nuclear weapons in this room. Um, but you, people might be against genetic research here. And so there's like a, we start getting on this gradient of sort of moral questions, I don't know, some sort of, that sort of area. Um, but non-commercial use is really obviously the one that we're all talking about, um, things like that. Um, there's some other similar licenses in this space. Um, there's one called the, um, oh, you probably can't see that because of the colors. It's called the No Harm License. So it's basically BSD three cores, um, but you're not allowed to use it for anything that promotes hate or um, violence and things like that. There's a whole bunch of other ones, uh, licenses that are like, this is like public domain, but you can't use it if you're a Nazi. It's like, well, <laughs> I'm not pro-Nazi, but yeah, yeah, um, things like that. Um, but the, um, the open source um, initiative have annotated their own um, uh, guidelines and um, under their equivalent clause, uh, equivalent um, uh, definition part of a license, we want commercial users to join our community, not feel excluded from it. You know, that's pretty good. And there should be no reason why um, um, whilst um, money and free software are often sort of uneasy bedfellows, there's no reason why they can't, you know, sort of rub along really well. You can make money from... Um, <laughs> redistributing free software or being part of development of it, things like that. And I, I, I'm pretty strong, feel very strongly this isn't a question of definition. So there's, um, when people talk about the problems with, say, the Creative Commons non-commercial license, often everyone's first response is, well, you know what, it's very difficult to define what so non-commercial is. Maybe you take my software and make a T-shirt out of it and then sell the t-shirt, is that commercial activity? Now, like, these are interesting questions to have over a beer later, um, but I don't, whether a license should restrict you on non-commercial basis is not just because one can't define where that line is. Like, it, it, it's like, it's sort of a moral thing about the, 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 the license in general and what should be considered sort of free software and things like that, so I, I when people jump straight to the, oh, it's about, um, oh, you know, you can't define exactly where the line is, I, th I think that kind of slightly misses the point. And so we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so what's like the rationale of what, why, why you have the Commons Clause to begin with? Uh, if you look, if you read their own words, like um, cloud providers have repeatedly violated this ethos by taking advantage of successful open source projects. Yeah, um, they use the monopolistic nature to derive uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in the, they're talking about AWS, I presume, um, and that behavior is damaged and people have gone out of business. So that's, that's the rationale on the other side, um, things like that. Uh, but the, um, sorry, I'm pushing through very quickly because I realized we were um, a bit delayed by the <coughs> laptop things. 
So the other problem here is that it's um, the sort of Commons clause and things like that are pushing a certain narratives, and I believe that um, the positioning and the way that people, new people, might come to free software might be sort of quite slightly changed. Or if they're thinking of trying to um, seek employment and, and they like free software, can it just remain a hobby for them? When you have these big companies relicensing software, you, it sort of pushes this narrative of uh, perhaps it just doesn't really work in this space and things like that. So I think that's the other sort of subtle problem um, with these kind of relicensing things. So it starts to say, yeah, you, free software must remain a hobby for you. You can't actually make any money. You can't have a company that's sort of ethical in, in this respect, things like that. Um, and so, so by using sort of slightly Orwellian-ish terms like that, if you see what I mean, like the source, of, the source is available, uh, it's, not, it's not great. Um, and it's also pushing the, the, basically the narrative that free software can't be um, financially self-supporting, which is like untrue. Like I, I'm standing here based on that. So it's just like, yeah. Um, but um, these narratives are extremely important. So... Uh, uh, having them splashed across various bits of news media or um, very prominent pieces of software in a particular space, like the web development space, um, does become quite problematic. Um, it, it might be also be accused of being sort of commons washing. This comes from um, um, green washing. You may have heard that, where people, you know, big comp big oil companies who are let's just say they're polluting, but they you know, do lots of nice things, or governments um, investing a lot in um, education, things like that. It's a kind of like, uh, it sort of looks good to the community, things like that. But calling it the commons clause was kind of quite clever and sneaky, because like commons is, you know, it sort of speaks to a certain other project in this area, um, and things like that. So it's sort of using um, the sort of moral authority of creative commons and I don't think that everyone in that organisation would agree with everything that the Commons Clause is after. Let's put it that way. I, I can't speak for any, either of those two parties, but that's probably true. Um, to be fair, to, to be very fair, the website does say it is best not to call Commons Clause software open source because they do agree that it's not an open source licence. They do agree that it doesn't, um, it's not uh, from the Debian Free Software Guidelines point of view. Um, that uh, a license with the Commons Clause is not a free software license from the open source initiative point of view. That's completely conceded um, on the website, um, except that on the Redis search website as of two hours ago, it still says it's an open source thingy. Ah. There's a pull request open since, yeah, it has some angry people. Don't pile on, but yeah. yeah <laughs> don't, no, please don't. Don't, don't. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's like, Optics are really important, narratives are very important, um, and things like that, yeah. And how you start the conversation is very important, so yeah. yeah. So I mean, what, what, what are the other downsides? Distributions can't ship the software, pretty obvious. Um, um, we removed Redis, from De uh, Redis Search from Debian, um, uh, also from Fedora. Um, and speaking to Nathan Scott from Fedora, we started what's called the Good Form Project, where we took the last non Commons Clause version, the AGPL version, and just forked it, and things like that. That's at goodformcode.com, um, things like that. Uh, you're basically going to have no community contributions because everyone's just going to run away. Um, here's one. I'm the row, yeah, yeah. Pile on there if you like. Just going to power through, sorry. Um, so what else? Where, where from here? So what do we actually need to do about this? Um, what did we do about it? Um, I have a quite a harshest critique of the community response to it because I think we were I think we were right morally but we just kind of pushed this in the wrong way uh, in many angles it's kind of interesting and like what can economically viable free software look like like I, yeah spoiler I don't know the answer but yeah what, what is what can this actually look like and, and work really well so yeah um, and so um, if you want to find out more about that, come to sort of part two of this at Copy Left Conf on Monday. Tickets are still available. Um, really, really looking forward to this. Um, so yeah, um, so 
please come to that. So, yeah. So, if there's any questions, please throw them at me now, or I th I'm not sure we're out of time, things like that. Do we have any questions? That catches us up. Oh, so we'll do one, we'll have time for one question. Uh, just very quick. How shall we? How shall we do the critique to the response, community response? Mm -hmm. Tools, um, processes, or places? How should we do the critique? Yeah. In what way? Sorry. I mean, you you said that that's the next step, right? Yes, we should we should look at the way we responded to. The relicensing. So, like self inspection, self, self. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, that's what you meant. Okay. Because I mean, in some way, our response was a failure in that um, it wasn't reverted. Like, ideally, good form code would just go away. Uh, it would go back to being a GPL and things like that. So, yeah, we need to work out why our response to it, whilst we made a bunch of noise, we didn't actually achieve anything. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Let's give Chris a huge round of applause. Thanks, Chris. Thank you.